uh, campaigns that we have to look at. But I now want to get to the most important criteria, the most important columns, and then I will stop and make myself available to you for your questions. And those, quote, most important columns are what kind of nonviolence was involved, if any? Is, is it strategic, principled, or some mixture of the two? And finally, let's put it this way. What kind of program was involved? Was it constructive program or obstructive program? And, or both. And as I think I've mentioned to you, it's very likely that we'll find as we go through the rest of the semester that a campaign will tend to be very strong on one but very weak on the other. There's very few that really get the two things in balance. And then you want to still take another step and have some kind of strategic vision where you can tell when to use which. So absent a Gandhi, how are you going to decide all of this? So in the interest of time, and because you haven't had much of a chance to read up about Chico, I'll just fill in these columns myself. And I would say that it's, it's pretty close to principle nonviolence. It's as close as you're going to get in Pax 164B. Okay? Pax 164A was the squeaky clean course where you have to practically be a Gandhi or we wouldn't study you. But in B, realize we're dealing with ordinary flesh. And, uh, but because the movement was primarily a women's movement, some men were involved, but only if they were sober. So that definitely limited their participation. It's a big problem in some parts of India and other parts of the world also. Um, it was primarily a women's movement. They did bring the men in. And of course, Bahuguna played a very strong leadership role in terms of being prominent and active, going from place to place, making representations of the government. It was he and not Nirvan that was able to do that. But it was mainly a women's movement, and they mainly, I don't know of a single episode where they threatened the axe men with violence. They, uh, it doesn't mean there wasn't one, and who knows what's actually going on in their heart. But I think as far as we can tell, and that's as close as we're going to get this semester, it was a movement where they wanted to protect life, and they were going to do it in a, yes, an interpositionary posture, getting in between what you guys are trying to do and the thing, but they were not against the accent. And of course, they didn't use any violence. So but pretty darn close. It's a pretty darn close to principle nonviolent movement. And I would say that it was very strong on OP, and it, it had a little bit of constructive program in the sense that they would be blocking the felling of the trees, but it's not like they were trying to rebuild their whole economy or stuff like that. There was some. The Bahuguna came in there, and he, he raised the consciousness of the people politically. It was definitely what uh, Paolo Freire calls conscientizao. I'm probably not pronouncing that very well. Not that? Pretty fair? How would you say it, Carl? There you go. Conscientizao. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> so it's what we call conscientizing, which is a disgusting word, but it sounds much better in, uh, in Portuguese. But it means getting the people up to the point where they can act politically and, and represent their case to the powers that be. And that's well, actually, that is, a, yeah, that is a good point. And in fact, uh, having mentioned the alcohol problem, it would not be fair not to mention that there was an, an anti-alcohol solution. Yeah, that actually was throughout the entire Gandhian movement in India from the late 30s onwards, that uh, the drink evil is, one, is the name of one of the 18 programs in constructive program. Wherever he went, people had to stop boozing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, John? Mm -hmm. Okay, John's question is a very good one. Did they even need constructive program given that before the, the industrial style felling started, they had a perfectly good lifestyle there? This, uh, a balanced economy and so forth, this leads to a very interesting point about globalization. And I'm not calling it globalization from above or from below for the time period. But if you think about um, indigenous forms of nonviolent culture before Gandhi comes on the scene and we start studying him and writing books about it and all the rest of it, there was a, an English anthropologist by the name of Fabro who collected a, a study of something like 55 country, 55 cultures where they had pronounced nonviolent mechanisms in their culture. But, and it's a very valuable resource, there's no denying that. But unfortunately, when these, um, it's very hard to find a non-prejudicial word for people living at this cultural level. But let's say pre-industrial people, they have these nonviolent mechanisms in their culture, they can be very effective, but what's gonna happen to them after contact? When they come up against the developed world, what's gonna happen? Uh, in at least uh, one case, and probably a lot more that I don't know about, these people became super violent when they were dragged into, let's say, the Cold War. I'm thinking of the uh, uh, Semi, people who lived in mountains high up in the middle of the uh, Malay Peninsula. They were very, very nonviolent. But when they got caught up in the Cold War, they were cannibalistic. They, they went ballistic. They were absolutely uncontrollable. So the question is, yeah, you might have a sustainable forest economy, which will work fine if you're going to be left alone. But what do you think the chances are that you're going to be left alone? There's a, so what we now need is a constructive program to rebuild an economy which will use the indigenous balance, but allow it to interact with the outside world. Right? That's, that's a challenge. I, I kind of wish it were not. You know, I wish that we leave those people alone, and they could be happy, and we'd be happy. Everybody happy. It's not going to be like that. There's a, there's a documentary film called um, a, a Message to, to Little Brother, which is about a community that lives high up in the Colombian highlands, which is now completely out of contact with the coastal Indians, because in the 17th century, of course, the uh, Europeans came in and cut them off. So they are totally enclaved. They live in these little island pocket fastnesses up on the, uh, in the, the Andes. And guess what? Their life is deteriorating, even though they have absolutely no contact with the European South Americans, because they're destroying the environment so fast that they can't live up there on their hilltops anymore. So there was one Indian in this group. I think this film is legitimate. It's, it's so fantastic. It seems like it's almost like a science fiction story, but it looks like it's probably legitimate. There was one Indian who happened to go down to the lowlands and marry a Spanish-speaking person so he could translate, and they actually invited a film crew. That's how we have this documentary. They invited a film crew to come up, walk across these rope bridges with their heavy cameras, and uh, film this village, and they gave us a lecture. They didn't see that mountain. It should be all green, and it's still brown. This is, what are you doing, little brother? You're destroying the world. So much as we may like to preserve these indigenous economies, I think what we have to do is preserve the principles that they developed and apply them in a way which enables them to live in the modern world. Because the one thing that I do believe about the globalist model or their ideology is that it's here. There's no, we're not going back to little isolated communities. That would be romantic and nostalgic. I mean, and I happen to be both romantic and nostalgic, but <laughs> that really doesn't work in the real world. Okay, so uh, by way of 
we'll transition to uh, the rest of today, uh, which wraps up what we've studied so far. As you're probably aware, there's going to be two questions, Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. <laughs> that wasn't very informative. Roman one will be uh, IDs, identification, and that's where you'll mainly use that list that I emailed out to all of you, but we won't be entirely confined to that list. There may be something that we didn't think of at that time, so don't be indignant if a term comes up that wasn't on that list, but most of them will be from that list. And what I'll ask you to do is briefly identify what this is. Uh, there was a system that we cooked up for last semester, which I would love to share with you, but I have to find some chalk. Ah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> this is funny, isn't it? I hope you'll find it funny. I started talking about these three things and I, I got sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> that's my middle name, no. Mike Sidetrack, and they call him. Peace, peacekeeping is getting in the way of hot conflict and chilling it out. Peacemaking is trying to resolve the issue that caused the conflict. And peace building is creating new institutions, cultural, social, economic, so that problems like that will arise. Okay. Um, now that you've got that, take it away. So what you should think of when you start one of these IDs is the first thing that you want to do with a term is to define it. In other words, don't start by giving some characteristic. Don't say, this is a very important item. It wouldn't be on the exam if it weren't an important item. We don't, we don't need your reactions. <laughs> you can put that in the course evaluation. <laughs> but tell us what the thing is. So if I were to take, suppose you had CBD, and you know, you're hip enough to know that that stands for civilian-based defense, you would start by saying, one of the two ways that nonviolence can be deployed against large-scale armed conflict, parenthesis, quote, war, unquote. And then you would say, it is what happens when citizens of a regime resist occupation of their um, cultural institutions not of their territory. So you don't, you don't do what's called shallow interdiction, keeping the enemy from getting into the country. You can't do that. Once they come in, you don't let them take it over. So that's civilian-based defense. So that's how you would define it. And then in some cases, you would need to attribute the term to the person who developed it. And that's important in our field because the field is so new and the vocabulary is not yet agreed upon. So for example, suppose you had Nagler's Law was an ID. <laughs> Whom would you attribute it to? Yeah, who is there? in grants to him anyway. Very good. So that may or may not be appropriate. Definition is absolutely indispensable, but attribution may or may not be necessary. Uh, then you want to contextualize it in the sense that if it's part of a set, tell what the rest of the set is. So classically, last semester, I would put out there, say, exchange power. And you have to say, it's a type of power which derives from the exchange of desired goods. Give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. It was developed, the concept was developed by Kenneth Boulding. It is the middle part of an important series which goes from threat power to exchange power to integrated power. And then you do an evaluation of why is this thing important for nonviolence? So let's keep that in the same, same grammatical voice. Evaluate. Um, and you say, it is integrated power, which is basically not the definition of how nonviolence works. It is the power of nonviolence, but the one that you're talking about is not. Okay? So in some cases, this may not be necessary because there isn't, there, it, there isn't a set. And in some cases, it may be obvious how it relates to nonviolence. So do be thinking of all of these. And we sometimes call this the base system. I'm going to patent it and sell it for nonviolence courses around the world, <laughs> make $10. Yeah. Um, but if you keep that little formula in mind, define first and att attribute, contextualize, and evaluate as necessary. And really, all of this can be done in two or three sentences. And probably you'll have 12 terms, read them over, think which 10 you want to take, and put the number in term, and then go. John? Yeah, if you have an event, like suppose, uh, well, an event or a campaign, but suppose I were to say the Sharpeville massacre. Okay, that's an event. You would definitely want to say why it was important, what principles were. In fact, that's a good point that uh, John is making. You should know the principles of nonviolence cold and use them all the time. I mean, don't worry about using them too much. You can, it's not, this is not a matter of style. You can be corny about this. <laughs> say, this involves the principles of ABC. Just keep piling it on. I mean, realistically, don't, don't just put words in there to fill out the paragraph. They have to make sense, right? Uh, we'll assume it'll still be awake at the time that we're grading your midterm. But uh, don't be afraid to use these principles. That's the whole point is to be able to see the principles at work in the episodes on the ground, okay? So that's the IDs, and the essay will it'll ask you to give like a historical. Again, you'll have a choice, probably give you three, I would choose one. Uh, take a historical overview of a certain period, and or oh, essays can be all over the map, really. It's, it's kind of difficult to prepare for them. You'll be much better prepared for the final exam for the essay questions there. Okay, now let's get to content, substance, things that, I mean, like maybe I got sidetracked at some point during the semester and didn't finish something, you'll want to ask me about that. Okay, so Andrea's question is about base communities. And uh, well, actually, you know, that's a, that's a column that we didn't put in here. Formats, new inventions, stuff like that. Um, originally, it was, I think it was not an acronym, it just was the word base. And it developed in Central America and South America, and it was also brought in to the Philippines. And you saw an example of the base community meeting there in, um, in Mindanao, I think. Yeah. Okay, but having said that, and I haven't really, that's not the definition, that's just telling me where it comes from. Who'd like to define it? What is a base community? Chaos, you know, from Interesting. I would actually use a different term for those people. I would call those people early adopters. Like if you go into any community, they will be, and you say, we're gonna try to do this nonviolently. You'll get some people who will say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, including even some men. So, but that is, that is a kind of an artificial community. That's just sort of an interest group. A base community is a real community where people got together frequently and it was in the context of evangelical Christianity, which has become a powerful force in Central and South America. You, uh, I can vividly remember walking through the streets of Leon at uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Everything is shut down except one building where people are standing up and holding hands and praising the Lord and singing loud music. And, uh, so it's because the way the church, the Catholic church got squeezed during the revolutionary periods, 
in the, from the 40s to the 60s that they ended up in an awkward position and people started defecting from them into um, other kinds of Christianity. Now, having said that, to be sure, the base communities in the Philippines are Catholic. There's almost no evangelical Christianity there. But these are real communities where people got together, got to know each other personally and socially, and talked about what they were going to do about their problem. And you remember that scene in that slum in um, Manila, I think is where it was, where uh, people were saying, the problem is that the government isn't listening to us, they don't know about our property, what are we going to do about it? So it kind of, uh, it kind of combined Christian cultivation, religious cultivation, with a grappling with the political problems that the community faced. And because there was, in many cases, no other organization to do that, the base communities became very important as a way of building movements. Now, there's also a modern version of this that Buddhist groups here are starting to build. Uh, I think this stands for Buddhist Alliance for Social Engagement, but I'm not entirely sure. And these are rather different in that they are not um, neighborhood communities. They're more like the kinds of communities that you started talking about, Marcel. And people are pulled together. The train meta is working with them, actually, on this. Pulled together, they get training, and they learn how to do social action based on meditation practice. And they, but they have deliberately chosen that acronym because they wanted to, to, to signal the fact that they were like the base communities. Catherine? I think it stands for Buddhist Alliances for Social Engagement, but don't quote me on that. Alex? Well, that's a good question. How are base communities different from affinity groups? I'm hoping that some of you can answer that question, even though we really haven't gotten to this in great detail yet. I know that's coming up a little bit later. But I bet some of you have had some experience with affinity groups, knowing you as I do. Anybody? Amy? Well, I think it's people that have Yeah, in Seattle, uh, tens of thousands of people were mobilized. And you need a way for them to get organized, and you don't want to use the old-fashioned way, where you take one charismatic male, put him at the top, and down it goes from there. So it's uh, much more from the ground up. It's called Basis Demokratie in the German Greens Party. And what you do is pull together people who have an affinity, the hence the affinity group. And it could be, um, I mean, I wasn't there, I don't know, but it could be almost anything, I guess. You know, you all, you all, all play the guitar, or you eat granola, or something like that. Uh, or, that or that you come from a given region. Uh, actually, granola wouldn't work, because I'm sure they all eat granola. But, uh, uh, and the point is, not, that, not just that you come together, but that you function as a unit throughout that campaign. So you have a representative who goes up to a, up a hierarchy to a group that's trying to make decisions with you. And very often, affinity groups will stay together after a campaign. And that's terrific, because one of the biggest problems in the whole peace movement for the last for the whole period that we're studying has been continuity. Yeah, every episode, you have to reinvent the wheel, get out the old Rolodex and start all over again, your Excel sheets. <laughs> Incidentally, this is one of the ways that uh, third-party nonviolent intervention has been helpful to the whole peace movement, is that people who have gotten involved in an attempt to interpose themselves in a conflict, that'll fall apart, no permanent thing will come out of that, but they will roll over and be the same people who will go on to found Peace Brigades International or Witness for Peace. So just because the thing has been happening quickly enough, there's been enough, on the personal level, enough continuity. Continuity has been a huge problem, and because of that, learning has been an even huger problem. Harvey? I'm not sure I did talk about the effervescence of the crowd. It's a sort of bubbly topic. Uh, what it refers to, well, does someone else know? Did someone come across it in our reading? I'm pretty sure it was in, yeah, Zoe? It, I bet it would come from Durkheim. It sounds Durkheimian to me. But what, mm -hmm. That you're exactly right. It is not necessarily positive or negative. And even when it's positive, it's partly negative. But go ahead, tell us what it is. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Momentum, fervor, those are all very good words for it. I'm not sure that it's essential that it be one person who sparks the crowd, but it usually is, I bet. But there's a strange phenomenon. The crowds themselves can somehow develop this fervor, and they can make people capable of doing things that they would not be able to do by themselves. And they can be practically unstoppable. However, the term effervescence connotes what? It's exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's just a positive spin on mob psychology is all it is. And that's why it's not such a great thing because the crowd can turn. And in fact, Rene Girard, who was the uh, expert on scapegoating, he has shown that the typical pattern is hail to the chief, jail to the chief. You know, the crowd will put somebody up on the pedestal and make him into a god. Then having made him into a god, they will sacrifice him. So the problem with effervescence is that it's effervescent. The, you know, you can't build a movement on seafoam. You know, you have to run around the crowd and get everybody's emails and talk to them later when they're sober and see if they're still interested. And this was the great, great power of constructive programming. That's where Gandhi really was a genius to do that because you could do spinning 